I'd recommend that you pay attention to next year's census data and that you do take part in next year's NCLS. It just so happens that I came across, the other day I came across a paper by a bloke called Bob Dixon, written in 2017, that made some predictions about what the Catholic community would look like by 2030. I think it would be a really interesting to compare what he predicted with the actual situation now. Well, what did this Bob Dixon guy predict? asked Father Tien. He predicted, said Sharon, that the Catholic population of Australia would continue to grow, although more slowly than it had in the past, but the Catholics as a percentage of the population would fall. He said this would be partly as a result of increased disidentification, that is, people stopping calling themselves Catholic, with most of those ceasing to identify adopting no religion as their label. He thought that the percentage of Australian Catholics born overseas would remain relatively unchanged, although the ethnic mix would change, so that, for example, our large Italian-born Catholic population would largely disappear. He predicted that the proportion of couples where both partners were Catholic would fall, and the proportion of cohabiting couples would increase. As for mass attendance, he predicted that attendances overall would continue to decline, down to perhaps as low as 5% of all Catholics, and that the low attendance rate associated with people under 35 would also apply to people all the way up to at least age 50. He said that the attendance rates of Australian-born Catholics would continue to fall, so that Catholics born in non-English-speaking countries would make up ever-increasing percentages of mass attendances in parishes around the country. The large majority of mass attenders would continue to hold key Catholic beliefs like the Trinity, the Real Presence, and the Virgin Birth, but there would be noticeable decline in some teachings, for example, the resurrection, the acceptance of the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Mass attenders would remain very strong in their opposition to abortion, but they would cease to be concerned about issues relating to sexual morality, like artificial contraception, premarital sex, and couples living together before <coughs> marriage. And he said that priests and mass attenders alike would be perfectly happy to leave it up to individual Catholics who were divorced and remarried without an annulment to decide for themselves whether to receive communion or not. In fact, this change in attitude, he predicted, would result in more people in what are referred to as irregular marriage situations returning to regular attendance at Mass. He also predicted that there would be extremely low numbers of people going to confession. He predicted that the number of diocesan priests in Australia would stabilise, although the proportion of Australian-born priests among them would continue to fall, to be offset by increased numbers of priests from places like India, Vietnam, the Philippines, Africa and elsewhere. He also predicted that religious brothers, such as the Christian brothers, would virtually disappear and that nuns would also become very rare. At this point, one of the younger members of the parish council interrupted to say, excuse me, Sharon, what's a Christian brother? <laughs> While another said, yes, and what's a nun? <laughs> well, you can see that I could get myself badly caught up in a time warp if I continue this story. Let me stop there and examine the claims for the predictions just reported that Bob Dixon made back then in 2017. First, I'm a sociologist and a demographer, not a theologian. So I won't talk much about the predictions I mentioned about married priests, female deacons, uh, authorised marriages taking, places in, taking part in places like uh, botanic gardens, or lay people administering parishes with priests subject to their authority. Um, but Pope Francis, but all of those are within the bounds of canon law, and Pope Francis is clearly prepared to talk about some of those possibilities. Besides, there's already quite a number of married priests in Australia, either because they belong to one of the Eastern Catholic churches, such as the Maronites or the Ukrainians, uh, those Eastern churches ordain married men, or because they are members of the Anglican Ordinariate, or because they've been married ordained ministers of other Christian traditions, usually Anglicans, who have become Catholics and have then been ordained as Catholic priests. Let's have a look at the evidence, shall we? Firstly, with regard to diocesan priests and religious sisters and brothers. Um, there are the figures for 1966 and 2016. 
for diocesan priests, religious order priests, religious sisters, and religious brothers. Now, what makes the, uh, you can see that the religious diocesan priests have slipped about 400, but they have stayed pretty much about that level, unchanging for quite a number of years, just below 2,000. And the reason for that is that although there are fewer Australian priests being ordained, um, more and more priests are being brought from overseas. And there doesn't seem to be any uh, intention uh, to change that practice. So I suspect that that will be an ongoing practice uh, for, for the next 13 years. It's only 13 years to 2030. It seems a long way off, doesn't it, 2030? But when you look back 13 years, what are we at? It's 2004. Doesn't that just seem like the other day? So 2030 is not far away. The huge, I'm not going to talk about religious order priests because, in a way, they're outside the control of the local church because it's, diocese, it's uh, religious orders that determine, uh, for, especially for worldwide orders, that determine how many people. And less than 50 are aged under 50. Most of them are aged more than 50. So, unless circumstances change, and really that's the catchphrase that goes with everything I say tonight, unless, unless circumstances change, the orders of brothers like the Marish brothers, the Christian brothers, the De La Salle brothers are going to cease to exist in Australia in the next 15, 20, 30 years. Um, of our 19, or in 2014, it was uh, 1884, diocesan priest. And you can see that, in fact, that illustrates my point. Uh, two years later, it was bigger. It's not going down. It's staying around about the same. So in 2014, it was 1884, diocesan priests, of whom about 600 were born overseas. That's 32%, roughly of all diocesan priests and they come from 58 different countries. Here are the main countries that they come from in 2014, 150 from India. These are diocesan priests, not members of the uh, MSCs or the Jesuits or other established orders. 75 from the Philippines, 68 from Ireland. Now they're not recent arrivals mainly, they're older men. Um, many of them retired. 89 from Vietnam, uh, 37 from Nigeria, and so on. Uh, now this is an incomplete table, but it's the best I've been able to do about how many seminarians we have at the present time, and it comes to about 180. Uh, there's no figure there for the Redemptorist Mater Neocatechumenate Seminary in Perth, because I wasn't able to find any, but presumably they have some, some seminarians. But to maintain a working population of about 1,500 diocesan priests in Australia, you really need about 250 seminarians. So, at any one time. I said there were 1,900 diocesan priests, but about four to 500 of those are already retired. So you've got a working population of somewhere between 14 and 1,500 diocesan priests. To maintain that number, you need 250 Seminary. So we're already looking at that, you can say that we're not going to be able to maintain that number unless we bring in priests from overseas. And that, as I say, looks to be a continuing policy. Here's a religious, the age profile of religious sisters back in 1976. As far as I can tell, this exercise has only been done twice. It was done in 1976 and that's a perfectly reasonable age profile for an organisation of adult women with some as young as being under 25 and then fairly even spread amongst age groups. In 2009 we measured it again and that's the age profile in 2009. And the median age, that's the age of the middle aged, the, the nun in the middle, is the 73. So that's what I say about uh, unless circumstances change we don't have a future workforce of religious sisters, don't have a future workforce of religious brothers, so where's that workforce going to come from? It has to come from the lay members of the church. Just as an aside, 
um, we've recently been doing a study of Catholic employment in Australia, the size of the Catholic workforce. You probably know that the Australian population is roughly 24 million. ABS will soon tell us what the latest figure is. 1% of 24 million is 240,000. Almost 1%, almost that many people work for the Catholic Church in Australia. It's, we think, and I'll have a final figure within a couple of weeks, we think it's about 230,000. Just under 1% of all Australians, 1% of everybody in Australia has a job with the Catholic Church. Whether that's in a parish, a school, a Catholic education office, a Catholic hospital, a Catholic social service, a Catholic university. They might not all consider themselves to be employees of the Catholic Church, but they are employed by Catholic organisations. I once said to a, um, an employee at ACU, she was asking me about what I was doing. And I said, oh, we've just been counting the Catholic workforce in Australia. We counted everybody who works for Catholic organisations and we counted you, so you're in our figures. And she was really cross. She said, I don't work for the Catholic Church, I work for a publicly funded university. So, but the facts are that she's employed by a Catholic organisation. Um, what about the Catholic population? I said that the Catholic, that bloke Bob Dixon back in 2017 predicted that the Catholic population would continue to grow, and it looks like that. That's a hundred years of growth. There's never been a census taken where there's been a fewer number of Catholics than in the previous census. It's always grown. Uh, and so it's very hard to predict that it won't continue to grow in the future. However, we don't yet know the impact of the, uh, the Royal Commission and the fallout from that, whether we will have massive uh, disconnection or disidentification with the church. Uh, let's hope not, but it could, could happen. But, and we'll set, get a sense of that as soon as we get these results on the 26th of June. Um, some people think that Catholic growth in Australia, Catholic population growth, is all about uh, impact of overseas new arrivals, and Catholics coming from overseas, like the Philippines and India and so on. It's not true. The proportion of Catholics born in Australia hasn't changed a little tiny bit in the last, um, since 1991, 25 years. It's always been 75%. So in other words, that growth that you saw is being contributed to equally by both new arrivals and natural birth. Okay? Um, however, we do have a problem that's associated, that's connected with that growth. And that is that we have <coughs> rather large numbers of people disidentifying. Now, a large part of that is understandable, I guess, that uh, in the 2011 census, perhaps somebody ticked the box for their children. And in the 2016 census, those people are not children anymore. They're ticking their own boxes and they'll tick whatever they choose. So some of that is a natural uh, fall off of young people making their own decisions and deciding not to call themselves Catholic, whereas mum and dad did call them Catholics. Um, but there's nearly half of that number who are older than that group and so they're mature age adults who are choosing, having once called themselves Catholics, not to do so any longer. We call that disidentification. And we think it's over uh, 200, uh, sorry, over 20,000 a year on average amounting to about 200,000 or a bit more between over a 10 year period. Um, Although the number of Catholics is increasing, the proportion of Catholics in the population will probably continue to slide. It reached a maximum in 1991 when it was 27.3% of the population. Now it's down to 253 or that's 2011 figures. Uh, and I expect that it will continue to fall. And most of the uh, fall is being picked up by smaller religious groups like uh, Hindus, to some extent Muslims, to some extent Buddhists, but the biggest gain is in the no religion category. And I expect in 2011 the biggest religious group were Catholics and the next biggest group was 22% no religion. 
But I fully expect, and so does everybody else, that at this 2016 census, the figures will show that no religion is the biggest group, um, more numerous than Catholics. And part of the reason for the growth is that it's a very, uh, it's, it's the, by far the biggest group chosen by young people. So as those young people move through the population, uh, as they get older, it'll become the dominant religious label, if you like. Um, another prediction was that the percentage of Catholics from non-English speaking countries would, would flatten out. And it has, you can see from that graph, that it's pretty flat. It's been around 18, 19% uh, for now for 25 years. Okay? Um, but the mix of Catholics coming from overseas countries will, will uh, change. That's the Italian population of Catholics in Australia. People born in Italy. It's heading downwards at a pretty steep rate. That one is the Philippines, and that looks set to become the biggest group because it's going to overtake Italians, probably at this next census, the last year's census. Uh, you can, it's very frustrating having had a census but not being able to talk about the results. Uh, but it's one of the limitations of census data that it takes at least a year uh, to be able to get accurate data. Um, that one is, sorry. India. India is growing quite fast. Uh, Sri Lanka is down there somewhere. That is New Zealand. There is uh, Ireland. That's interesting, isn't it? We, we, I tend to think that the Irish bubble has come and gone in Australia, but no, Irish immigration is increasing. And uh, the last one up there is Great Britain, which is a big number, and it's on the increase again. But it looks as though clearly that the Philippines will be the dominant immigrant category in Australian Catholicism in the years to come. Uh, let me just illustrate this another way. It's the same point that I'm making. But here's the age profile in 20-year uh, age groups for a number of different countries from which Australia's Catholics have come. So firstly, I'm going to show you the proportion of all Italian-born Catholics in Australia who are aged under 20. And you have to look really carefully. There it is. Can you see it? <laughs> Put it up again. Watch. There it is. That's the proportion of Australian-born, uh, sorry, Italian-born Catholics who are aged under 20. That's the proportion aged under 40. That's the proportion aged under 60. And everybody else, making up 100%, is aged over 60. So, we're not going to have, you know, we've got, Melbourne particularly, it's got heaps of Italian parishes. We're not going to have that for very much longer. Um, this next country is Poland. And it's a bit similar, not quite as, Severe is the Italian situation. The next one is uh, Philippines. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble seeing the screen. Philippines, you can see it's quite a different age profile. Not very many old people at all. Not very many. Uh, Iraq, a bit similar to the Philippines. And then look at South Sudan. Hardly anybody over the age of 60 amongst the Sudanese community. A smaller community, by sure, but for sure. But an implication of this, for example, is for the work of migrant chaplains. It's going to change. You've got, if you've got two migrant chaplains, one working with Italian communities and one working with Sudanese communities, they're going to have totally different issues to be dealing with. And that's all Catholics, and they're roughly equal in size. Now, let's talk about um, changes in sexual morality, which we can measure. That's fairly limited about what we can measure using the Australian census. But the, uh, sorry, this is not really sexual morality. It's, it's to do with marriage. And that is that uh, as 
Catholics shrink in their proportion of the population and as the population grows, and as religion becomes less important in families, people are going to be less uh, determined or less uh, concerned about finding a partner of the same religion. And so we'd expect that the uh, proportion of Catholics who marry other Catholics will slip, will fall, and that the proportion of couples who are of mixed religion, Catholic and something else, will grow. And that's happening, you can see that in the figures. Um, now, turning to cohabiting couples, um, these are the, this is the proportion of all couples where at least one, cu one partner is a Catholic. And you can see that the proportion of couples who are living together without being formally married uh, has doubled just about from about 8% to 16% in 25 years. Um, in Australian parishes, we asked a couple of years ago, 2013, we asked uh, 100 parishes to tell us what was their experience of young couples coming to prepare for marriage. And uh, we found that in that time, sorry, 147 parishes it was, 8,344 couples had come to prepare for marriage. And amongst in the major city, 61% of the, those couples were already living together and not making any pretense about it otherwise when they talked to the parish priest about getting married. That went up in inner regional areas, places like Ballarat, Goulburn, uh, Rockhampton, and even went up much higher in remote areas, which you can sort of understand if a couple are moving, living in a uh, mining community or something like that. Uh, problems of finding two different housing, two different households is, is magnified. So um, the, the norm is that young couples live together before marriage these days and maybe live together <coughs> instead of marriage rather than getting married eventually. What I've been talking about is Catholics in the Australian census. The, the responsibility of the Australian Bureau of Statistics to collect that data and to publish it and for us to work with it. Now I want to talk about mass attendance, people who go to mass and, and maybe filled in a survey called the National Church Life Survey at their parish one day in 2011 or, I can't tell you the results yet, one day in 2016. I know people here at Campbell Parish filled it in in both years, perhaps you filled it in in whatever parish you come from as well. So this is the percentage of Catholics who attend Mass on a regular basis, weekly. It reached a high peak in the 70s, in the 1950s, of over 70%. And it's been declining pretty steadily ever since. Um, it's down to 12.2% last time we measured it in 2011. We also measured it last year, we don't have a figure yet but I suspect it'll be about 10%. And as Sharon reported me saying, um, in 2030, she said that back in 20, I said it would get down to about five or 6%, and I think that's right. Uh, it will continue to decline, but it won't go to zero, because we have, uh, there will always, always be people attending mass, and there will always be, especially, people from um, immigrant communities who will be attending mass. I'll show you that in a moment. This is the, another thing that makes me say that age, that uh, mass attendance will decline, is the age profile. Let me just show you the first of those graphs. That's the age profile of mass attenders in 2011. And you can see it's skewed towards the older end. The peak of the graph is at age 60 to 64. But, and so in 20 years time, that peak, or let's say 30 years time, that peak is going to be severely diminished. Um, look how different the shape of the graph is to just 15 years earlier in uh, 1996. Um, it's quite significant that that's a much more evenly spread age profile, that people across all ages of the middle years from the late 30s to the late 60s. Now this is a graph of age 
uh, mass attendance by age. Can you see the different colours? Perhaps I haven't chosen the best contrasting colours there. Can you see that? Yeah. There's a part of the left-hand end of the graph which is the proportion of each age group that attends maths. And you can see, if you look at the 20 to 24 year age group, which is the third bar up from the bottom, only about 5% of all people in that age group go to Mass on Sundays. That's probably corresponding with your experience. The best attending age group up there is the people in the 70 to 74 age group, which is the third bar from the top, and that's more than 30% of Catholics, more than 3 out of every 10 Catholics in that age group, will be at Mass next Sunday. Now, what we've found happening is that those lower percentages are gradually creeping up as time goes on. So instead of the current crop of people in their 20s and 30s who have a low percentage reacting as they get older and getting up to the 30% like when they get to the 70s, that's not happening. They will take their low percentage rates with them as they get older. Let me show you. There's the figures. I don't expect you to take all them in. Let's just highlight a couple of them. Firstly, look at each of those rows across the row. They're the attendance rates for the well, top bar is the 20 to 24 year age group. And there are four columns for 1996, 2001, 2006 and 2011. And the percentage attendance in each of those years for the same age group it's gone down from 7.2 to 6.7 to 5.4 to 4.7. So every single year that we take this measurement, the attendance rate for that age group has declined. And they're in five-year gaps. If you look at the other three lines that I've highlighted, it's the same story. Okay? There's some that run against that trend. Here they are. Um, those age groups either stay the same between 2011 and 2000, sorry, 2001 and 2006, or they increased a bit, but they're the older age groups. Okay? So that's where a lot of the vitality for parish life in Australia is coming from at the moment, those older age groups. This exercise is slightly harder. I want you to envisage a group of people, a group of mass attenders, and watch them get older every five years. They'll be five years older. Okay, so we'll start with that top line, which is the 20 to 24 year old age group. Five years later, in 2001, they'll be 25 to 29 in that age group. Five years later, they'll be in the age group 30 to 34. And five years after that, last time we've got a measurement for, they'll be in the 35 to 39 year age group. Look how they've taken their percentage attendance rate with them. 7.2, it's gone down a bit, 5.6, 6.2, 7.9. It's almost the same after 15 years as it was at the start. That's what I mean by the fact that as our mass attenders get older, they're taking their, their age cohorts attendance rates with them. So we can't expect, we can't say, oh, as they get older, they'll come back to Mass. It doesn't work that way. I've just been talking about Mass attendance rates by birthplace. Now let me, <coughs> sorry, by age. Now let me show you by birthplace. That's the attendance rate for Australian-born Catholics over a 15-year period, from 1996 to 2011. It's dropped from about... 16 or 17 percent to under 10 percent. English-speaking Catholics from other countries like the UK, New Zealand, the United States and so on, they've got a higher rate but it's declining at the same rate. The same, it's, it's dropping at the same rate. But look at the Catholics born in non-English-speaking countries. Their mass attendance rate is staying roughly stable and it's above 20 percent. So more and more, our parishes are relying on our immigrant Catholic populations, particularly Filipinos. My own parish relies very heavily on the Indian, Indian-born Catholics and Sri Lankans. 
Um, so without, uh, without our immigrant Catholics, we would be in, our attendance would be much, much worse than it currently appears to be. Um, I showed you that graph at the beginning. Um, that's the percentage of Catholics born in Australia, of all Catholics now, not just mass attenders. It stayed steady at 75%. But that's the percentage of mass attenders born in Australia. And that's going down. Um, and as I just said, the proportion uh, immigrant Catholics are becoming more and more populous or more and more um, prominent in our mass attendances. Um, five minutes, okay. Um, I'll very quickly deal with these issues. And that is that um, we're, healing, we're dealing here with uh, beliefs. I've said that, or Sharon said for me, that um, back in 2017, Bob Dixon predicted that uh, Catholic, that the beliefs of mass attenders would stay roughly stable, but may, some of them may decline a little bit. And there you can see the proportion of Catholics, uh, sorry, the proportion of mass attenders who accept the official teaching, if you like, of the Catholic <coughs> Church that Mary was conceived, uh, Mary, sorry, conceived Jesus without sexual intercourse, the virgin birth. Um, and there we have a percentage of Catholics even creeping up a little bit or staying pretty stable, 69, 77, 78, 75 over, over successive five-year measures. The real presence of the Eucharist is very, very high in acceptance level, 90% of Catholics, and that doesn't appear to be going down anytime soon. Uh, understanding of God as Trinity, again, pretty high. In fact, it's crept up since 1996. Now, the one that's gone down is the belief in the bodily re resurrection of Jesus, down to 71% at the moment amongst mass attenders. What do the others say? They say, well, it's rather a symbolic teaching about what happened to Jesus after death. Um, on a couple of sexual, sexual morality issues, or rather I don't like calling abortion a sexual morality issue, it's really a life issue, a uh, very high level of opposition to abortion. Uh, abortion is always wrong, say 85% of mass attenders, or it's only allowable in extreme circumstances. But look at that premarital sex. As I said, it's going to become a non-issue. Already, for only 41% of mass attenders, and that's all ages, and it's the same across all ages, uh, would say that premarital sex is always wrong. The majority opinion is that premarital sex is okay if it's part of a committed relationship. Um, and as for communion for the divorced and remarried, um, without an annulment, most people already, this is 2011, think that that's something that they don't agree with and the developments in the last couple of years and the publication or the release of Amoris Laetitia would suggest that it's going to, be, it's going to drop off the radar as an issue for Catholics. Um, I'll skip over this. The other issue that I said was uh, going to drop off the Radar, if it hasn't already, is the question of artificial contraception. Those two contrasting colours, uh, the first batch is for mass attenders aged 15 to 34. You might say, what are 15 year olds doing using contraception anyway? And the second bar is for 35 to 39 year age group. But the light and the small bar is for those who say they only use natural means of contraception. And this is, the question is only for those for whom this question is applicable, which is, of course, not everybody. Uh, and the red bar, the right red bar and the big bar, is for those people who say, we use, my partner and I use, a variety of means, including artificial means of contraception. Uh, and finally, um, well, I won't show you, I won't talk about those graphs because we are running out of time, but they basically say that hardly anybody is going to go to, is going to confession now and it's going to, people are not showing any signs of coming back. So there's the predictions that I've made and there's the evidence for them. And I just now want to say that um, I'm well aware 
as any demographer, is that circumstances might change. What are some of the things that might change? And you've probably got in your head a number of things that might change. Firstly, the government might change regulations regarding immigration. So we might stop getting Filipinos, for example. That would change our Catholic mix. Um, that's just as I've said. Um, we don't even know whether we'll have the proper data to measure these things by. Um, ABS threatened not to run a census last time, so will we still have a census in 2031? Um, National Church Life Survey to measure the attitudes and values and practices of mass attenders, will we still have that? Um, we could have a religious revival, revival. Nobody can see it coming, but that's the thing about unexpected events, you can't see them coming. Um, we could have a resurgence in vocations. We could have, and this is quite a considerable likelihood, that we could have some negative reactions affecting um, disidentification as a result of the Royal Commission. And we could even have changes in the Catholic world due to changes in government funding. The Australian Catholic Bishops' Conference have decided to have a plenary council affecting, uh, inviting all Australian Catholics to be to have a say in the future of the church in Australia in 2020. That might produce some outcomes which influence these predictions. Of course, Pope Francis has proved quite unpredictable so far, and he might uh, create some new factors that influence these predictions. And who knows what Pope Francis II might do. <laughs> I'm going to finish there, and we'll have some time for some questions. Um, but I would like, no, let me just finish with this statement from Genevieve Lacey. Some of you may know Genevieve, she's a, an outstanding musician, a recorder player, a world-renowned virtuoso musician. And a couple of years ago she gave a public lecture about music and this is what she had to say and it's about musicians but it's about us, it's about the church. She says, this thing is an activity that connects us deeply to others. It can change how we perceive the world and then how we decide to live in it. To listen suggests an open, receptive stance without necessarily knowing what will arrive. It suggests, in other words, you're prepared to listen when you don't know what the answer is going to be or even whether you'll like the answer. It suggests alertness, willingness. Listening is essentially an act of respect and generosity. It's a time for hearing others' needs and opinions. Listening with care, hearing complexity, and noticing subtlety need not be purely professional music practices, but tenets for living. And I would say tenets for the church, if the church is to become what we want it to become in the year 2030. Some of the predictions I've made tonight are the I want to point out to you just a couple of resources that are available to everybody. They're on our website. That's the parish profile for every single parish in Australia, which is on our website from the 2011 Australian Census. Um, and we have also done a study of some of the more uh, creative and vital parishes in Australia called the Building Stronger Parishes Project. We have some reports of that on our website that they're available for purchase. And our chief researcher on that project, Dr. Trudy Dantas, has written this wonderful book designed specifically for use by parish councils. Um, there are my contact details and our website address. Uh, I hope you can, uh, can, can gain some value from the work that we do. So I think we'll leave it at that at this point. Thank you very much, Bob. Please thank Bob for his address.